Thank you for joining us today for this Art in the Library's virtual program. I'm Sally Brown, Exhibits Coordinator for WVU Libraries. I am honored to turn this over to Lynn Stahl, Lynn Stahl, WVU Librarian for the Humanities. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Sally. Um, I'm honored to have a part in this event. Nick is such a wonderful colleague and I've learned so much about the envir environmental and legal history of Appalachia from his work. Um, so Nick Stump currently works as the head of reference and access services with the George R. Farmer Junior Law Library at West Virginia University College of Law. His scholarship explores environmental law, critical legal theory, law and social movements, and critical approaches to legal research and analysis. He teaches in the legal research curriculum with an emphasis on energy and environmental law and public interest oriented research methods. And Priya Baskarin is assistant professor of law and director of the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic at American University Washington College of Law. As director of the clinic, Professor Baskarin provides pro bono transactional legal support to small businesses and individual entrepreneurs in DC and Virginia. Professor Baskarin's scholarship, advocacy, and teaching center on increasing economic opportunity through transactional lawyering. Prior to joining the faculty at Washington College of Law, Professor Baskarin was an associate professor at West Virginia University College of Law, where she taught in the business law curriculum and served as director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Law Clinic. Um, so as Sally said, we'll have Q&A following the interview. You can put your questions in the chat at any point and I will keep track of them. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Nick and Priya. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited to be here, uh, even virtually back in Appalachia and really excited to talk about this book with Nick. Um, but first I wanna give Nick the opportunity to, um, you know, to say a few words before we really start diving into the interview. Absolutely, and thank you so much. Um, so first off, just a deep thanks to the organizers, including Sally, Mondi, Beth, Priya, and to others who have helped put this event together. Uh, and also a big thanks to WVU Libraries for hosting uh, and to the other uh, wonderful co-sponsors as well. And uh, lastly, uh, a profound thanks to the WVU Press and especially to Derek, um, our absolutely amazing uh, press director for, uh, for publishing this book. Great. So Nick, this is a mixed audience. So I think it's important before we really dive into the meat of the book, to provide some kind of basic foundational knowledge. So let's talk about Appalachia. So what in your opinion is Appalachia? Mm -hmm. So there's just not one uh, definition of the region. Uh, I think activists and scholars have uh, long rightly contested, you know, such a universalizing definition of Appalachia. Um, however, I think you're right, this, this is something of a, a mixed audience, which is great. Um, but I do think an introductory definition uh, could be uh, beneficial um, for some folks. Uh, so the Appalachian Regional Commission or ARC has a mainstream and uh, very influential definition of uh, the region. And per this ARC map, uh, Appalachia stretches across 13 states uh, from the top of Mississippi up to New York. And uh, ARC has further divided Appalachia up into uh, five subregions, um, and of these subregions, I mostly focus on Central Appalachia and on uh, North Central Appalachia in the book. Um, and I think we have a, a link uh, to that uh, influential ARC map that we can um, drop into chat. But it is in chat. So I, I want to pull on that a little bit. So why does this book focus on Appalachia? Yeah, um, great question. So so Appalachia, as I argue in the book. Um, is important for understanding the broader failures of uh, environmental law. As I argue, Appalachia has uniquely been devastated by the fossil fuel industry, um, really for, for much more than a century. Um, and it continues to uh, be so today, um, both through uh, coal industry uh, and the uh, natural gas industry and related um, petro petrochemical renaissance in particular. Um, and then also on a more personal level, I am from uh, West Virginia. Um, I was raised in Buchanan, which is in the north central part of the state, and I have worked at the WVU College of Law for the past um, decade, uh, almost. So I do feel uh, very rooted and, and very much a part of the uh, of the region. Okay, so is this book like a personal passion project, or why did you write this book? 
Yeah, so I wrote the book because I did think that there was room in the literature for the sort of perspective that I bring, um, which is really a radical legal left uh, ecological position. Um, I do think it's probably fair to say that most US legal environmental scholarship is often more liberal uh, or progressive, and it is not, uh, is not more radical, right? It's not, it's not situated on the, um, the, the uh, legal ecological left, right? Um, so that's sort of the perspective that I hope was fresh um, and needed and that I brought. Okay, so I keep hearing the word legal. So is the book only for lawyers? Like who is the audience? So yeah, so I would say that I, I hope that the book would appeal to an interdisciplinary audience. Um, so certainly environmental uh, legal scholars, folks on the uh, broad legal left, both in the US and um, beyond, certainly Appalachian and, and the rural studies folks and um, uh, grassroots uh, organizers and, and activists sort of in a general sense. Um, but you know, that being said, as one special audience, I, I do think that the book likely has real value for law students, uh, lawyers, and activists who, who are particularly interested in environmental issues um, and deeper social change, right? And, that, and that's just because the book talks about lawyering and grassroots movements um, in a sort of unique way that is you know, often not discussed in traditional US law schools or in traditional environmental practice. Um, you know, namely, this is again a radical oriented uh, grassroots uh, bottom up uh, approach to uh, to lawyering, which is a bit out of the, the mainstream. Okay, so what would you say are your main takeaways for this for this audience for your readers? Mm -hmm. So I would say the major takeaway, the sort of uh, thesis statement, as it were, is that environmental law and the broader liberal paradigm that it is embedded within has failed Appalachia, right? And so we, you know, in the end, don't need more environmental law reform alone. We instead need true transformative change or systemic reformations, as I call them in the book, uh, beyond our current uh, paradigm, which is paradigm of liberal capitalism, and a bit more specifically beyond the paradigm of white uh, patriarchal uh, capitalism, right? Okay, so I, I want to push you on that a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about how environmental law has failed Appalachia, maybe a, a little bit more background information about the law and its shortcomings? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and in the book, th there are sort of two levels of analysis. Uh, one is the technical or operational analysis as to how environmental law specifically has failed. Uh, and the second is sort of a, a broader systems analysis that again goes more towards um, uh, liberal liberal capitalism. Okay, right. But before we get there, let's cover the environmental law part first. So, a, a, absolutely, yeah. So environmental law um, is sort of a unique uh, legal regime com compared to many others. Um, it constitutes a constellation of statutes that were very rapidly passed after the uh, sort of so-called uh, environmental revolution, I'd probably say the environmental awakening um, of the 1960s. Right, and these environmental statutes include the uh, National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, uh, the Clean Water Act, right, the Clean Air Act, uh, important for Appalachia, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act uh, or SMACRA, right? So again, it's a sort of constellation of these different statutes. Um, and again, the core of these statutes were passed very rapidly um, after the environmental revolution um, at the end of the 1960s, really throughout the 1970s, and they have been um, refined, right, in, in the decades uh, since. Okay, so that's the universe of the laws. Um, can you talk a little bit about the technical failures of these laws or environmental law generally? Yes, absolutely. Um, and there are a number of um, interrelated technical or operational um, flaws with, with environmental law. So one was that it was just sort of enacted in an ad hoc or fragmented manner to begin with in, in the 1960s and 70s and thereafter, right? So environmental law tends not to work harmoniously. It's not you know, a mutually supportive uh, set of statutes very, uh, very often, right? So again, it's, it's a fragmented legal regime. They often say the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Also in creating 
environmental law, the federal legislature delegated, you know, um, immense authority to what I think and what many folks think are fundamentally non-democratic agencies, right? Such as the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. And these agencies were very quickly captured by industry, right? And regulatory capture occurs when industries co-opt and control those environmental agencies that were supposedly uh, regulating them, right? So, so it's, you know, and it, regulatory capture is a very sort of um, perverse uh, phenomenon. Environmental law also is uh, infamously hyper-technical. It's very dense, it's very complex, which has locked out the broad citizenry from engaging with it in a meaningful sense, despite some mechanisms that are at least there in theory, like um, uh, notice and comment rulemaking. Um, but on the other hand, this complexity has not at all harmed industry, right? As industry does have, you know, very deep uh, technical expertise that it deploys through lobbying. Um, and of course, industry has the capital, right? Required to uh, sort of comprehensively co-opt um, various forms of, of, of lawmaking. Okay, so I, I, wanna, I wanna pause here and I, I would like you to go a little bit deeper into this concept of industry co-option. Can you give me more of a kind of concrete example? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so sort of a, a foundational example, um, in fact, at the very beginning of environmental laws enactment, again, back in the 1960s and the 1970s, industry and complicit lawmakers secured legislative outs through which they could continue to pollute, right? So that happened at the very beginning, uh, namely through uh, permitting regimes, such as those permitting uh, regimes that were embedded in the Clean Water Act, right? Which ended up being important for Appalachia, right? And, and so through these permit to pollute legal regimes embedded into environmental law that industry secured, I think ultimately environmental law has not served to halt environmental destruction. What it does is it organizes it, right? You got your permit. Uh, to, to despoil the environment. And so then it's, then it's perfectly legal, right? So, so again, I think this is a sort of a foundational example of how at the very beginning, industry co-opted environmental, in that case, legislative lawmaking, um, and then it's continued to control it through different mechanisms involving um, different branches of government. <clears throat> and it's very fascinating. You hear that all the time, you know, sort of the, that concept of pollution permits, right, from environmental activists. So that's, that's, that's really helpful. Can we narrow that a little bit further and talk about maybe how environmental law has failed Appalachia specifically, since that's sort of one of the focal points of the book? Um, maybe you can focus on the mountaintop removal example. Yes, um, absolutely. And well, first and foremost, from, from sort of a law and political economy perspective, capitalist growth has historically been um, fossil fuel driven, right? Makes sense, right? You can't grow or run factories without fuel. Right, yep. And so Appalachia, with its vast deposits, right, of coal and oil and gas, um, has been absolutely central in the U.S. to this historical process, right? Um, folks often say that it's been pillaged as a national sacrifice zone or an energy sacrifice zone because both the land and the people have been exploited in order to keep energy prices low uh, for the nation, uh, again, to drive economic growth, um, and ultimately from the critical perspective, right, to facilitate uh, capital accumulation among um, elite uh, energy interests. So yeah, Appalachia. So mountaintop removal mining, which has occurred uh, mostly in the central uh, Appalachian part of the, of the, of the region, um, is likely among the best in, in recent examples in recent historical times um, of this uh, phenomenon, um, right? And mountaintop removal mining uh, has been um, an intensive mining practice for the last uh, three decades, although it's starting to decline now. Um, and as the name suggests, it essentially just involves chopping off the top of uh, mountains um, uh, through explosives and, and use of, of heavy machinery to get at the coal seams uh, beneath. But it's a remarkably destructive practice. To date, it's destroyed over 500 mountains in Appalachia, uh, much more than 2,000 miles of ecologically crucial headwater uh, uh, streams. Um, folks have compared it more to volcanic eruptions um, in the literature than, than to traditional mining practices or deforestation. Um, and of course, uh, mountaintop removal mining has had profound social uh, and public health impacts um, on the Appalachian citizenry as well, in addition to indirect uh, impacts caused by the um, 
different models can explore such as the natural resource curse. And so for anyone who's unfamiliar with mountaintop removal uh, and can see Beth Torin, her background is actually a mountaintop removal site. So you can see how huge and decimated that really is. Um, so let's go back to this whole concept of environmental law. I mean, you talked about all of these different statutes. I mean, you called them a constellation. I mean, and doesn't SMACRA specifically address mountaintop removal? Yes, and that's such a good question. Um, so in fact, mountaintop removal mining was not banned by federal environmental law as it should have been. And in fact, uh, Appalachian activists and organizations worked very hard to try and ban uh, surface mining altogether uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, but they were you know, tragically ultimately um, unsuccessful with those efforts. And instead, SMACRA or the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act uh, was passed, um, which is a very watered down uh, act, right? Did not, uh, again, uh, ban surface mining at large. And uh, among other things, it was, it in the end permitted mountaintop removal uh, mining, right? So yeah, so ultimately mountaintop removal mining is governed by a permit to pollute legal uh, regime, right? That, that we were mentioning um, earlier, uh, namely by permits that have been issued under the uh, Clean Water Act, um, and then the actual MTR, or Mountaintop Removal Mining Operations, are, are governed by a very complex set of um, cooperative federalism type environmental laws, including uh, SMACRA um, and the um, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, right? So, but basically in sum, that mountaintop removal mining occurred in the first place, right? That it has even happened um, and wasn't banned by uh, federal um, environmental laws as Appalachians wanted it to be is a, is a profound failure in and of itself, right? Um, and an exemplar of, of, um, of, of what's wrong with environmental law. Okay, so again, I'm hearing that the statute doesn't provide broad enough protections and then sort of kicks the can down the road to these like permitting agencies, right? Which again, is just this non-democratic agency issuing permits that are actually harmful. Yes, okay. right. Um, and then there's a second level failure in Appalachia as well, right? Um, that's why, again, it's such a good case model for the failure of environmental law in the US because mountaintop removal mining is unique and that the environmental laws that we have on the books that again, as, as I argue, and many other folks have argued too, I'm thinking about Professor Barry Wood off the top of my head. Um, so the environmental laws, which were deeply flawed to begin with, were not then enforced even, right? The law in the books were not enforced by the federal and state agencies at issue, such as core agencies, uh, including the US Army Corps of Engineers and, um, and state agencies uh, to which authority ha has been uh, delegated, including, um, the West Virginia Department of, of Environmental Protection. Okay, so I, I have to stop you right there. As a lawyer, I'm hearing enforcement issues, right, which means that your agency can be sued if it's not doing its job, right? So isn't that the solution? Yes, also, also such a good question. It, but what's happened over the course of decades is that when Appalachian environmental organizations in tandem with uh, legal organizations brought suit in federal Appalachian courts uh, to force agencies to enforce environmental law, very often over the decade, key federal, again, Appalachian appellate courts ruled in, in favor of industry and what's now an infamous string of um, litigation losses for uh, for Appalachian environmental plaintiffs. Um, so, you know, the, the environmental plaintiffs certainly um, didn't lose every time, but it was, you know, they, for, for decades, they, there were really a string of losses um, that were uh, devastating and absurd on their face as the law clearly supported the environmental plaintiffs against the industry. How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, such a fantastic question. And that kind of allows us I think to return back to the central critical legal theory arguments, right? Or the type of critical theory that I draw on, which is um, uh, more of the Marxian tradition, right? So again, recall that capitalist growth has historically been fossil fuel driven as broadly supported by the state and the US, right? So it's not just these captured environmental agencies such as uh, the EPA and so forth, that have supported this historical process. Um, 
but it's also been the state uh, and federal courts uh, in Appalachia that have very often, not always, but very often worked together historically to support this exploitative fossil fuel paradigm that again has devastated the land and people in our, uh, in our region. Wow, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm really understanding this captured agency, captured courts, captured you know, governance in general. You know, I'm, I'm getting a sense of why Appalachia has really been called this energy sacrifice zone. Yes, right, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, the, the, the nation, uh, you know, for more than a century and a half has needed our natural resources in order to drive uh, economic growth, supposedly to the benefit of all. Uh, and so the courts alone can't and won't stop this process, right? I mean, and this, again, this historical process has had incredible uh, historical momentum. Um, it involves quite a bit of extensive fixed capital and fossil fuel uh, industry infrastructure and so forth, right? And so, you know, these environmental citizen suits alone can't change the, uh, can't change the, the little capitalist paradigm, essentially, right? Um, and again, should emphasize there's been much great work done from time to time there has been environmental uh, legal victories. Um, but the fact of the matter is the fossil fuel industry persists. Um, right, mountaintop removal mining lingers, just despite the fact that it has rapidly declined in the last decade. Um, there's just a great article uh, last week, I think in Salon, about how new mountaintop removal mining permits continue to be um, handed down. And uh, of course, the natural gas industry and the related uh, petrochemical industry that's um, right, experiencing, quote unquote, petrochemical renaissance is, uh, despite the hiccup during the, um, uh, the pandemic, um, is generally on the rise, right, in that block chip. Okay, so you know, <laughs> broken statutes, co-opted courts and agencies, it really feels like this kind of David and Goliath problem. So does this kind of bring us to the systemic aspect of your book? That's right. Um, I mean, I do think that the, the system, as it were, is, you know, purposely being kept broken or, or purposely being kept flawed in order to protect uh, the financial interests of these energy companies um, and their beneficiaries. Um, and again, this really is a central insight of critical legal theory, or again, the type of, of critical legal theory that I draw on, which is really in the ecological uh, Marxian uh, tradition, right? Because not, not all critical legal theory um, uh, goes there. Um, but again, most basically, we can't redress these core flaws um, alone through more environmental law reform from within the system, right? As the system itself is defined to, is designed to benefit the status quo, right? So again, as I argue, I do think that we ultimately need a strategy leading us towards transformative change, or again, as I discussed in the book, uh, systemic reformations. Okay, so let's talk about some of these um, systemic reformations, especially in the context of what you're bringing up is sort of like the critical environmental legal, you know, commentators perspective. Yeah, so, so we, um, as in, you know, many critical environmental legal commentators, or again, folks who are situated on the ecological legal left, um, we do tend to call environmental law liberal environmental law, um, because again, it is, it is merely embedded within and ultimately supportive of, uh, of liberal capitalism, right? Again, a central critical argument. Um, so in contrast, uh, through this critical legal perspective, that's again more in the Marxian tradition, um, I argue that liberal capitalism is not just unjust, right, as it exploits uh, labor and so forth, but that it ultimately is um, ecologically, uh, is ecologically unsustainable, right? Okay, so I want to push you on that a little bit. Why is it unsustainable? Yeah, so most basically, um, the, the capitalist mode of production is, is marked by the drive for ceaseless capital accumulation, right, through repressing both labor, but also nature, and the quest to commodify everything, right, or, or to uh, turn everything into commodities uh, for the market. And capitalism also functionally requires perpetual economic growth in order for it to keep going, right? So without perpetual economic growth, um, right, we, it's broadly agreed that capitalism would uh, collapse. So where's the problem? Um, right, this drive is, uh, I think, inconsistent with our bounded world of 
finite resources, right? So what we are now seeing with uh, what we tend to call late stage capitalism is not just the destruction of niche sacrifice zone regions such as Appalachia. And of course, I should add um, the continued decimation of the global South in particular through uh, neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism uh, and so forth. Um, but ultimately, right, the, the world at large uh, is generally now threatened as aspects of the uh, global ecological crisis, such as uh, climate change, um, impact us all, yeah, universally. Okay, so if you'll permit me a, a small pun, um, kind of going back to your, you know, why Appalachia, um, this is sort of Appalachia being the canary in the coal mine, right, mm -hmm. some of the challenges that we could all globally be facing. Okay, so now that we've hit this wall, um, so to speak, uh, within you know, this constellation of statutes within the traditional legal framework, you know, what do you propose as your alternatives to environmental law in the book? Yeah, so, so specifically as the title of the book uh, suggests, I do draw on for my solutions um, the schools of eco-socialism, eco-feminism and the closely uh, related school of degrowth as well. And in the book, this transformative ecological change is broken up into two main uh, dimensions, right? So the first dimension is um, socio-legal transformative change, right? And so I propose bottom-up mass mobilization alternatives to modern hyper-technical environmental law, such as the uh, Clean Water Act, right? Um, and I discuss these socio-legal uh, transformations as being systemic stepping stone measures, right? As rather than um, accept accepting the existing system, they can help us uh, serve as stepping stones towards a more transformative and ecologically sustainable uh, future, right? So that's one major dimension of the book, these socio-legal transformations. The second are the uh, economic transformations, more radical economic transformations, right? Um, again, as directly drawing on eco-socialism, um, a you know, materialist, um, eco-socialist, uh, eco-feminism, and degrowth as well. And mostly in the book, not to get too far in the weeds, I discuss post-capitalist solidarity economy modes um, in the region. And I discuss nurturing these, uh, particularly in the context of, uh, of course, Appalachia, um, but, also, uh, but also beyond. Okay. So can, let's start with the first one. Can you tell me more about the socio-legal approach? Yes. So, so on the socio-legal um, front in the book, um, sort of again, as compared to, to modern hyper-technical law that has served to lock out the citizenry in favor of uh, elite governance, again, I argue for a bottom-up mass mobilization steeped uh, approach to certain ecological doctrines that actors such as um, radical cause lawyers and uh, radical community lawyers to, to, to return to lawyering um, could help drive in, uh, in Appalachia. Okay, so that sounds like a 10,000 foot view. Can you give me a more concrete example? Mm -hmm. so, so in the book, I you know, explore a few systemic stepping stones, uh, socio-legal measures. Um, I think probably the most interesting and promising is a radically reconceived approach to what's called the public trust doctrine, right? Um, and in a nutshell, the traditional liberal public trust doctrine dictates that the state holds certain limited natural resources and trust for the public at large, with the public at large serving as the trust beneficiaries. Um, but again, you know, it's a, it's a liberal, uh, historically, uh, type of doctrine, the public trust doctrine. And, and again, the, the resources that have been um, covered are, 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 have historically been very limited, such as waterways. Now, what I propose in the book is a critical approach, right? That as I um, discuss, breaks and remakes the public trust doctrine along uh, more radical lines, right? So I argue that essentially a bottom-up mass mobilization steeped public trust doctrine could, in a nutshell, help the people take back the land right, from absentee owners uh, and so forth. Um, and then the land or the ecological commons could thereafter be self-governed by the citizenry as a form of, uh, again, as a form of uh, ecological commons. Okay, so returning to Appalachia, what's an example of this sort of in Appalachia? Yeah, so as the, as the concrete example um, that I discussed in the book, uh, so Appalachia, um, as many folks um, here I'm sure know, uh, infamously has a mass absentee corporate land ownership and also abandoned 
uh, mining uh, land problem, right? As has been um, uh, studied and chronicled for decades now, um, such as in you know, the initial study, I think it was called Who Owns the Land? And I think we have a link to either uh, that study or um, some follow-up studies that we can drop into chat, um, right? So this type of absentee owned land or abandoned land or other types of, 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 of related land could be redistributed back to the Appalachian people um, via a grassroots driven um, it would have to be a grassroots mass mobilization um, radical approach, right? Um, so grassroots driven state action, as again, could be dependent on a, um, again, radically re-envisioned uh, approach to the public trust doctrine. It's not the classic or traditional public trust doctrine. You're breaking it and remaking it to serve as a stepping stone, again, to get us to more of a um, uh, transformative future. It's, breaking and remaking doctrines is, is often discussed in the literature as forms of um, uh, reframing uh, social action frames, you know, along radical lines and so forth. So it's sort of an accepted way to, to um, work with pre-existing doctrines and to shape them to more transformative ends. Okay. Okay. All right. So I, I get that. That's the socio-legal change. So let's talk about the other elements, right? Which is the radical economic change. You know, what does this look like? Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately the, you know, the socio-legal transformations are designed to help um, support, right, the radical economic change. They do work together, um, or as I argue in the book, as you know, most critical commentators would argue. Um, but yeah, but I'm looking at just the radical economic change um, uh, explorations I discussed in the book certainly covers a lot of ground um, in the book. Um, but in a nutshell, the, the sorts of things that I discuss uh, involve, uh, first and foremost, ending perpetual economic growth uh, and moving away from the paradigm of uh, commodification of everything, or again, just turning things into um, commodities for the market, right? This critical approach instead entails uh, production, not for the market, but for what's often called in, in critical language, use value, right? Or production based on things that we actually need in our communities that we dem democratically determine that we need, right? Things such as, for instance, food, medicine, housing, infrastructure, um, and again, what are we moving away from? Well, we're moving away from production for what's uh, termed generally exchange value uh, in the market, right? And not based on uh, uh, use value. Okay, so, it, so that's exchange value in the market. It's like the frivolous, you know, Kim Kardashian line of lip gloss. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, great example. Yeah, in an eco-socialist future, I imagine we would democratically determine that that's not a great production line uh, to, uh, to continue. Okay, so how does eco-socialism then fit into all of this? Yes, so eco-socialism. Um, I should say that these are varied schools, so I'm only drawing on certain uh, strains of, of both um, eco-socialism and eco-feminism and degrowth, in fact. Um, but again, sort of in a nutshell, eco-socialism and, and the sort of strains of eco-socialism that I discuss in, in the book do involve uh, collective ownership, right, of the means of production, not private ownership, and collective ownership can be cooperative, public, and so forth, um, and also multi-scale democratic uh, economic planning, right? And this is uh, most critical uh, you know, legal left ecological commentators would agree is required to most immediately eliminate fossil fuels, um, right? Um, seize them and, and eliminate them as production lines and transition to a wholly clean uh, post growth uh, energy system, right? Um, and and I, 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 and again, most you know, critical ecological commentators think that this could only be accomplished on the sort of cl climate change timescale that we have via. A, a very swift transition to democratic economic planning modes. Um, so that's eco-socialism, just a bit on, on, uh, on eco-feminism if we have time. So eco-feminism, um, again, very varied uh, school, um, but in a nutshell, you know, the sorts of strains that I draw on, on the book involve centering care work or centering what's called reproductive labor, like childcare um, within such uh, uh, transformations and also, of, of course, changing gender regimes, right, to, to, um, to account for more just approaches to uh, reproductive labor, certainly accounting for compound forms of repression along lines of uh, gender, race, um, indigenous issues, the global north and, and global south divide, um, right, as also, as also at the same time entwined with these ecological issues as um, ecofeminism is a holistic approach, right, as all of these issues are being um, in some way produced by um, uh, white patriarchal capitalism. They're just operationalized differently across the world, right, through, through a materialist approach. Um, so it is a holistic approach. And of course, you know, um, the, the sorts of strains of ecofeminism I draw on the book 
uh, involve you know core um, scholar activist approaches to discussing ecofeminism, which involve uh, learning from and letting lead right actual uh, pre-existing grassroots movements. Um, and just supporting them right through the sort of um, praxis um, that I discuss in the book, which have historically um, and today predominantly been led by um, poor and working class women, uh, women of color, uh, indigenous women globally, right? And again, that's another core insight of, of ecofeminism that I, um, that I draw on uh, in the book. So Nick, there have been a lot of really great questions in the chat and I wanna make sure we leave time for them. So I wanna end with just one last question. So sort of succinctly, if you can just give us a, like a snapshot into, you know, what the implementation of your recommendations would look like in Appalachia. Yeah, so as I um, discuss in the book, it could be radical cause lawyers um, or more radical oriented community lawyers or similar types of, of lawyering that could help drive and support uh, creation of things like radical uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives, right? Um, such as the formation of community-owned uh, clean energy systems and actually community-owned uh, food systems, right? Um, which is essentially a form of, of, of bottom-up change uh, in Appalachia. Uh, and I can add, Priya, if you don't mind me saying so, it's particularly wonderful that, um, that you're here with us today because while at uh, WVU, um, Priya did engage in community lawyering uh, work in Southern West Virginia and Central Appalachia that included uh, forming uh, co-ops, um, which is fantastic. Um, and, but at the same time in the book, I also discuss how such bottom-up change can and probably must be pursued synergistically with other transformative change modes that are more associated with top-down change modes. Or really, you could argue this is, it's different scales of change, right? Uh, local, regional, national, international, that all are um, uh, pursued in a, in a, right, in, in a democratically planned manner, um, such as working for a radical eco-socialist steeped Green New Deal uh, in Appalachia. Um, and again, uh, wonderful that we have Priya with us because she has a forthcoming law review article that um, has a, a great section on such an Appalachian uh, Green New Deal. Um, and uh, I think we also have the link to that, which we can uh, drop in chat. And um, I followed that article from the beginning. It's amazing. Um, so I encourage folks to, to check it out. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but lastly, uh, just two things. One, I, I definitely need to note that such systemic socio-legal change as dovetail with potential you know, radical economic change is, is simply not possible um, at the local or, or regional levels alone, right? There is no um, you know, post-capitalist Appalachia, there's not a post-capitalist uh, U.S. as entwined with, with broader international work, again, specifically accounting for the global north caused uh, devastation and subjugation of the, glo of the global south, right? So such change has to be um, coordinated as I, as I discuss at large in the book. Um, and again, uh, or as a final point, I should add, um, in the book, when we're talking about, or when I'm talking about uh, radical cause lawyers or community lawyers helping to achieve such change, it is supporting movements that are already uh, on the ground, right? The, the praxis is a supportive um, form of praxis, right? To let the, the movements on the local communities um, lead and self-govern themselves. It's just how can we help, right? Um, based on the specific types of legal and, and socio-legal tools that we have. And um, as I'm sure Pre can tell you that that's a core idea of community lawyering, right? Is that you um, serve and support uh, the community that self-determines uh, itself. Well, thank you so much for that, Nick. Um, the book is great. I read it uh, and I hope everyone here will read it. And we just have so many fantastic questions in the chat. I'm going to turn it over um, to Lynn and Sally to kind of manage the queue. Awesome. Thank you both so much. It was really great to hear you in conversation about this. And yes, our virtual forms of applause um, are now happening. Um, so yes, lots of really great questions in the chat. And you can continue to put those in there um, and hopefully we'll get to as many as possible. Um, so first, um, Nick, is a question about the reception of your book within Appalachia. Um, this person asks, Appalachian communities are perhaps stereotyped as being conservative and wary of leftist views, um, even though this doesn't hold true historically. Do you think many members of Appalachian communities will be um, wary or even dismissive of your approach? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And that's something I've talked 
a lot about with folks over the years as I put the book together uh, and now that it's out. And I think that's a terrific point, right? Um, certainly Appalachia is not a homogenous place in terms of um, political views, but, um, but certainly, yeah, it's not associated with widespread uh, leftist views necessarily, right? I, I think it's, it's fair to say that there's not a critical mass of, of folks who, who are already interested in the broad region and such systemic change. And so that's really something that I tackle in the book, right, is if we think that this sort of change might be, you know, not just desirable, but necessary, given the fact that the global ecological crisis is a civilizational issue, right, um, experts are worried that could result in breakdown of, um, of, of law and society, essentially. So if it's something that we think we need, how can we go about discussing such change, right, um, in the region? And I think there's not just one answer to that. Um, but I do think a materialist approach is, is very helpful, right? So before you even think about sort of base building or expanding your base of folks who are interested in more leftist change, you have to know your community. It's best if you're from there, right? So when I talk about radical cause lawyering or community lawyering in Appalachia, I mean folks who are from those towns and from those localities, right, who are doing that sort of work. Um, and then it's just all about how perhaps you frame the issues, right? Um, based on like a materialist approach, how you know a community, what they might be most interested in. In many instances, rather than focusing on uh, negative points, right, such as the harmful legacies of um, the fossil fuel industry or even the ills of capitalism, perhaps, right, given a specific community, it might be more helpful to frame the positive aspects that an eco-socialist or eco-feminist future could require, perhaps not, you know, using the words eco-socialism or eco-feminism, such as providing basic infrastructure, right? As we all know, there's um, uh, a lack of uh, clean water and uh, uh, sanitation services in uh, Southern West Virginia. So if you talk about the sort of change that could provide folks with the water that they're lacking and the sanitation infrastructure that they're lacking, right? Start there with the positive things that such a transformative future could bring. Perhaps we could base build, perhaps we could reach more folks right through that type of language. And again, have to emphasize radical community lawyering involving lawyers from those places, right? Great, thank you. Um, the next question is sort of to combine questions about corruption. Um, so over and above the issue of regulatory capture, does your book address whether corruption in Appalachia is a problem as well? And then a follow-up from someone else that I've sort of paraphrased here. What are we defining as corruption? Are, are big bosses using legal loopholes and workarounds corrupt even when they're acting lawfully? Um, and what does it mean when we democratically elect someone as governor who's um, sort of embroilment, including things like unpaid taxes is well-documented. Yeah, so I um, do touch on issues of outright corruption, both historical and contemporary in the book, um, but not as much uh, as, um, as many other commentators. I'm thinking of my colleague, uh, Professor Jamie Van Nostrand, who has a, a book coming out on um, uh, failures of governing elites, I think with... Uh, with uh, Cambridge before too long. So a lot of other folks touch on that more. I tend to work more at the systems level um, and about how corruption is just one element of the failure of these, um, of these socio-legal and, and economic systems. So, not, so it's, not a, it's not a deep dive in the book, it's more uh, tangential. Great, thank you. Um, next, and you've touched on the first part of this a little bit. Um, does the book discuss just energy transition as a part of eco-socialist or eco-communist practice? And do you believe that it's possible for Appalachian actors to push for this themselves through working class environmentalism or labor coalition building without centering actors outside the region? Yes, so the book does touch on that. Um, that's such a fantastic question. And um, I cite to Professor uh, Annie Eisenberg's work on dress transitions in um, rural America. I encourage folks to go um, look that up. It's, it's also um, public access scholarship that's available. Um, uh, for free online. Um, so yeah, I definitely do discuss clean energy uh, transformations um, and how the framing involved with a uh, just transition towards you know, truly clean energy systems uh, might work. Um, as part of the book, I'm thinking particularly in chapter, um, in chapter seven uh, towards the end. Um, and it, 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 but again, it is more of a 10,000 foot view um, I'm talking about in terms of eco-socialism and eco-feminism as a form of uh, collective ownership mode, right? So it's the actual community at issue that would own much of this um, uh, uh, clean energy. 
uh, infrastructure. And also that when you're talking about um, the intersection of bottom up and top down, that you know, obviously we need this bottom up approach to a transition to a clean energy future. Um, right, it doesn't need to be the local um, communities that issues that are owning that issue that are owning um, much of it. But again, we, the climate change uh, is real. We've, as, as we all know, right, we have a very rapid time scale um, that we need to uh, completely transition to clean energy sources, ex excluding natural gas. Right, by clean energy, I mean renewable uh, energy and energy efficiency modes, and that can only be accomplished also through um, national and international work that has to involve uh, economic planning, which again is central to eco socialism and. Uh, eco-feminism, right? So there's a tension there. It's obviously not a tension that I myself um, can resolve that I touch on that we need the bottom up uh, collective ownership approach, but we got to have the national and international um, pivot to, to economic planning when it comes to this sort of thing. As again, it's, uh, it's a civilizational issue. Um, great. And the next question is about sort of intertwined um, social forces and activist movement. And, and so this person asks, are there advocacy alliances possible between activists in Appalachia and BIPOC communities who decry um, fossil fuel racism as in the red, black and green New Deal. How does racism function as a divisive force in environmental movements? Yes, yeah, so that's, I think that's a great question. Um, Priya, you might have more to say, but just because your, your latest article is, is sort of on that specifically. Um, but if not, I can give it a shot too. No, sure. I, I'm happy to weigh in on this. I think that there has been, um, so as you know, there are a couple of things that I, I want to make sure to touch on. The first is that there has been a lot of solidarity, at least on the grassroots level between communities that are impacted, you know, in like perceived white spaces, um, you know, and communities largely of color in um, you know, in urban spaces. So my article kind of talks about two communities that are greatly impacted by this within Appalachia, within West Virginia specifically, which is demographically the whitest state within Appalachia. But the first communities to be impacted by infrastructure racism are actually communities in McDowell County that were historically African-American. And we see the same structural forces legally that created these sort of like deprivation zones, you know, divestment zones in both places. Um, and, you know, a, another really fantastic book that the press has come out with, I'm Afraid of That Water, sort of talks about, you know, uh, chemical contamination with the Freedom Industries spill um, contaminating Charleston and the communities that were impacted in Charleston, which again, has a large historically uh, black community that was heavily impacted. Service industry workers were heavily impacted. And it was happening sort of very closely to Flint sort of breaking in the public news. And there was a lot of solidarity movements and efforts happening behind that. Um, Catherine uh, Flowers has also written a fantastic book about wastewater infrastructure and the connections between what's happening in Alabama's Black Belt and what's happening in like rural Illinois, right, which again is like largely white. So I think, you know, and, and these things we also see happen in like Latino communities in California. So it's sort of like a coalition of the oppressed opportunity to engage in movement lawyering. And that's who engages in activism. That's who engages in, you know, movement lawyering and grassroots representation are people who are excluded. So I, I do think that as more and more people become excluded, which is inevitable with climate change, that we are gonna see a, an opportunity to galvanize that movement. Great, thank you both um, for that one. Uh, next question, do West Virginia resource barons um, retain the political power that they had in the Blankenship Benjamin era? So, I mean, I, it is often discussed in the literature that despite the fact that, you know, the coal industry has declined pre precipitously uh, in the last decade, coal nevertheless retains a um, pretty strong political and, and cultural influence just because of historical uh, momentum uh, and so forth, right? So I do think that um, generally speaking, the, the coal industry, um, is able to uh, sort of punch above its current weight, weight class in, in terms of um, uh, political operations, again, because of that momentum. And, um, and of course, natural gas um, is something different, um, but, uh, but it's certainly on the rise um, and is um, moving forward, um, gonna be one of the major um, uh, environmental concerns in the region. And certainly they have 
that that industry uh, as as is chronicled in literature does have um, uh, strong uh, political uh, and lobbying capabilities, right? I think that's fair to say and that's been well chronicled, yeah. So to piggyback off of that also, I mean, Nick uses coal as an example in the book because it, there's such a it's such a long-standing industry in the region and there's like a wealth of resources you know but again like the freedom industry spell happened like january 2014 you know and the ability to punch above its weight class in terms of you know who was involved in governor tomlin's uh group to make the law happen about what the safety precautions were environmental activists were explicitly excluded but industry lobbyists were you know part of that plan <laughs> and then when the legislature turned like changed over you know they completely gutted what was then called like the people's bill that provided all these protections i mean this is this is 2014 you know so this this is all like still recent and relevant and important to these communities and that's the largest city in the state you know um so it i think it really speaks to the volume of the problem that's a good example um, next question, what role do you see municipalities playing in reclaiming the ecological commons? Do you think there's a path for libertarian municipalism to radically change energy systems? Or is this a process that would necessarily need to occur outside of any structure of governments? That's a really good question. Um, it's not something that I have a ton of expertise on um, or touch on in the book other than more of a theoretical or exploratory level. Um, but I do, I mean, I, as I generally argue in the book, I do think that uh, local approaches, which could include uh, municipal government approaches, um, certainly do have an important place in any movement towards uh, transformative change. But I, but again, generally, as I argue in the book, anytime you're working with a pre-existing system, right, um, and, you're, and you're talking about even reforms from within that system, you just have to have an eye on transformative change, right? Um, not just what one specific reform or change within that system can do, but what's your eye towards this, the systemic stepping stone measure, right, to, to, to be on the system. And I think that applies locally as it applies regionally. So again, as, to the extent that I talk about it, it's that sort of thing in the book as it's out, a bit outside my wheelhouse, yeah. But I, I will say that it has tangible, practical value. I mean, uh, one of the most beautiful things about West Virginia is the sort of kind of mountaineer spirit, right? Of like, there, um, I used to have all of these students who would say, I'm very politically conservative, but I truly believe it government provided wastewater infrastructure and community owned broadband, right? Which which just sort of speaks to the this feeling of communitarian communitarianism that does exist desire after being a sacrifice zone for so long and being excluded for so long um, to be able to have some sort of control. And this again, goes back to what Nick was saying about the absentee land ownership. I mean, there are communities that don't have wastewater or can't put in broadband infrastructure, not only just because of the cost, but because they don't own the flat land around them in order to be able to do that. That it would be a very motivated municipality in order to actually you know, engage in this work. Um, and I, of course, I have to say my, co my former colleagues at the uh, uh, Land Use and Sustainable Development Law Clinic are doing some of the most like cutting edge and amazing work to support these municipalities and doing kind of this like, you know, a version of this recommoning type work that Nick has brings up in his book. Thank you. And then next question is sort of circling back to things you've touched on, Nick, um, but who exactly is at the bottom of bottom up change? That's, yeah, that's a really good and interesting question too. Um, so again, I tend to use a materialist approach, um, let's say the Marxian tradition. And through that approach, you just have to take the specific communities, localities, regions as they actually are, right? Um, so the folks who actually live there, what the specific political economy is like there, right? And when you're talking about bottom up, where I would tend to call more bottom up type change, um, it would be, again, the folks who, who who happen to be in the specific areas um, 
and what they might need to actually achieve something like a radical multi-stakeholder food cooperative or something like that, right? So I think the bottom up differs from place to place who those folks might be, the different sort of um, uh, social, political, and economic regimes that have been there, um, right? So you always have to account for that. Um, but the but in my mind, the general difference between bottom up and, and top down is that you are going to the communities and working with the specific um, communities at issue to work on something more at that scale or to dovetail what they're doing with something at a larger scale versus if it's more top down or just more at a different geographic level, it's a much larger population, right? The like ARC's definition of Appalachia could include pretty big, right? But parts of 13 states. Great. Okay. So we've got three minutes left and three questions left. Oh, so I think we I'll can quick. get yeah. through them. Um, so first, can you speak a bit about your personal work to connect these theories to praxis? Specifically, what are you doing to meet community leaders and work with them on projects that are important to them? Yeah. So I think of this in terms of two different silos. One is the sort of professional uh, legal expertise and work that I do. Um, and that is a, a form of praxis where I um, write on a critical legal approach to legal research and analysis, which is how you find the law and how you think about the law. And I, and I teach and I write about that in a grassroots um, sort of manner in which you can involve the uh, general citizenry more in the traditional legal research and analysis process through, through certain mechanisms. So I've worked with clinics uh, and, uh, and students and so forth who are interested in public interest work. And that's my sort of uh, professional praxis, right? Is, is again, a um, critical legal research approach that supports, that really can support public interest lawyering. The second is more personal work that I do completely separate from work uh, involving activism. And um, I can talk more about that in a different forum, but since this is a WVU event, it's more of the, uh, the WVU type uh, professional praxis work that involves applications of some of this stuff. Thank you. Um, okay, is West Virginia reinventing its demise environmentally with the new ecotourism movement that's taking hold? <laughs> Great question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's well put. Um, yeah, especially with the uh, designation of the, the new national park uh, uh, and so forth. Um, definitely is pr a problematic type of development and is certainly not sufficient in, in and of itself, right, to get either the state um, or, or the region going in a more uh, transformative and ecologically sustainable uh, position. Yeah. All right, and then I think oh, one more has popped up. Let's go with this. This is kind of a big question. What do you make of the large energy corporations that are recently pushing for a carbon tax or investments in carbon capture and sequestration technologies? Not great. <laughs> yeah, a form of, of uh, green capitalism, ecological moder uh, modernization, right, where um, essentially trying to uh, co-opt efforts towards real transformative change to an ecologically sustainable future by incorporating um, in bad faith, I think, um, such uh, policies, right, such uh, clean energy transitions into the capitalist mode of production. Um, a, a clean energy transition within uh, liberal capitalism is, is insufficient. It's not enough um, to, to avert uh, climate change and the other aspects of the global ecological crisis, like the loss of di uh, biodiversity globally and uh, um, pollution issues uh, and so forth, right? So the, the green capitalism simply won't work. We need true transformative uh, changes, I think that uh, that question suggested, uh, towards something perhaps like an eco-socialist, eco-feminist future. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I will turn it back over to Sally for a little bit of wrap up. I think Beth just put the link to um, the press website where, where you can buy the book um, into the chat. So that's there as well. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you all, this has been Outstanding, as someone said. And she's also, Beth is also going to put a link to our survey for this event to get some of your feedback. And thank you all for attending. Our next session is June 25th. Out of the margins, librarians share their published books. So I hope you can join us. And thank you again. Enjoy your afternoon.